very good. Well, I think we'll we'll begin. Good. Um, having said that, there are still people wanting to come in. Good. All right. Um, as I say, a very warm welcome to a rather later than usual uh, event in our ongoing series of online events. Um, I noticed quite a few unfamiliar names. So for those of you who do know about Insiders Outsiders, you'll forgive me if I just say a few brief words of introduction about the project and uh, show how this session fits in so well. Um, basically, Insiders Outsiders was, I suppose, <laughs> I don't want to pat myself on the back, but a kind of small idea I had that got quite large way back in late 2017 uh, to look in a detailed and more nuanced kind of way at the tremendously rich and pervasive contribution of those who found sanctuary in this country from Nazi Europe to British culture. And it initially took the form of a year-long nationwide festival uh, straddling all arts forms between March 2019 it was and March 2020. And I have to say it exceeded my wildest expectations in terms of the level of interest and indeed those wishing to partake, you know, to contribute to the festival. And then, well, you all know what happened in March 2020, COVID struck. Luckily, you know, most of the festival had already taken place. But uh, just suffice it to say that the obvious thing to do, as so many other people did, was to go online. And as some of you will know, we have ever since then been conducting... This is the woman introducing it, I think. Okay. Yes, it is. If you wouldn't mind muting yourself, could everybody make sure that they're muted, please? Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, uh, so an ongoing series of online events, increasingly in collaboration with other organisations, but uh, basically I just wanted to say that Harry Weinberg, obviously as somebody who was Berlin-born, Jewish, came to this country indeed as a young man <laughs> and made his see, I, Before this I was looking at poetry being can, read. Can, I've if, still got that programme on. Hold on, let me see if I can, hold on, there's somebody who is not David, I think is mute him, sorry. Okay, fourth possible muting. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, yes, no, Harry Weinberger clearly fits the bill in the sort of strict, you know, parameters of the festival, but what the festival was also, is still very much about, are the rich and fruitful interactions between those who came from uh, Central Europe and those indeed on the ground, those who were born on these shores, more or less, and, uh, you know, to see, see what com comes out of those sorts of collaborations. So Rebecca Moden's book, which has just very recently been published by Palgrave Macmillan, as I imagine most of you will know, called Iris Murdoch and Harry Weinberger, Imaginations and Images, very much fits the bill, and this, uh, Obviously, this this talk is to mark the launch of that very substantial book, which obviously Rebecca will be telling us more about. Um, she is, though, for our purposes today, I think I'm right in saying, Rebecca, aren't I, that you will actually be focusing perhaps more on Harry Weinberger than on Iris Murdoch, but equally, you know, making it very clear that your interest is in the interaction between the two of them. So very, very briefly, an uh, uh, introduction to Dr. Rebecca Moden. She's based apparently in Stratford-on-Avon, but actually her research is uh, uh, sort of centred on the uh, Iris Murdoch um, Centre has sort of come out of that in at the University of Chichester, um, and uh, clearly the book, the, well, the book started as a you said an MPhil, then PhD, and uh, ultimately a book which of course becomes much more than a PhD. Um, and she's currently also co-editor of the Iris Murdoch Review. So she's coming to Harry Weinberger very much initially, at least from the literary perspective, Iris Murdoch specifically, but I should perhaps just as a parting shot before I stop talking and hand over to Rebecca, say that I had the pleasure of meeting and indeed spending quite a lot of time with Harry Weinberger in his Leamington Spa home. You reckon it was around probably about 200 to 2000, sort of 2002, when I was asked, in fact, to write a, a shortish essay about him for an exhibition catalogue by Duncan Campbell, who was his uh, his main dealer. And I have still very vivid memories, both of him as a, as a man, as an individual, as an artist, and indeed his wonderful home environment and indeed the studio as well. So I'm very, very curious to see, to hear what, what Rebecca has to say. So without further ado, and please everybody uh, just note that the event is being recorded. If you don't want to be uh, seen, then obviously you know what to do, turn off your cameras, please ensure that you're muted if you wouldn't mind. And uh, I think Rebecca, Rebecca's going to talk for 40 minutes, 45 minutes thereabouts, plenty of time for questions uh, and discussion. If you would like, you know, when things occur to you, type things into the chat. You all know the ropes by now and we will play it by ear, see how it goes. Rebecca, thank you for being here and over over to you. Thanks, Monica. And thanks everyone for, for coming along. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, if you could just bear with me. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, and uh, I hope you can all see that. Um, there we go. Okay, 
Um, so um, I'd like to start uh, by providing some brief biographical details about Harry Weinberger um, and some discussions of certain paintings of his, and then to move on um, to, to touch on the subject of my recently published book, uh, which is The Friendship with Iris Murdoch and its impact on, on both of them. So here's Harry Weinberger. He was born in Berlin in 1924. He was the son of a wealthy Jewish industrialist, and he lived for the first nine years of his life with his family in a luxurious flat on the banks of the River Spray. And his earliest memory was of watching boats on the river from the balcony of the flat, and, and boats became a lifelong theme in his painting. The household included a Russian artist, uh, Grigory Osharov, who was called Uncle Grisha by the children, and Osharoff taught Weinberger to paint, so he had this interest in painting from a very early age. And Weinberger's life changed irreparably when Hitler came to power in 1933, and as a child he witnessed the increasing unrest and, and violence and the burning of the Reichstag, and the family fled to Czechoslovakia. Um, and Weinberger, aged 15, was eventually sent to England with his sister Ina on the last kinder transport in 1939, and he was to live in England for the rest of his life. He lost relatives in concentration camps. His father's factory was taken over by the Nazis and his family home was later destroyed by bombs. And he lost contact with his parents during the war years. He did eventually trace them through the Red Cross. He found out that they were living in Switzerland and he re-established that relationship, but they were permanently damaged by the devastating impact of the war. And, and he found it difficult to communicate with them. They never really recovered um, from that. And so he came to England at age 15. His older brother and his two uncles were already living um, in England. And so too was his cousin, Heinz Koppel, who was four years older than him. And Heinz Koppel had also lived in Berlin, moved to Czechoslovakia in 1933, and then came to live in Wales in 1938. And he too became an artist. And the two, the two cousins were lifelong friends um, and uh, spent much time talking about art. And, and uh, Koppel was an influence on Weinberger, undoubtedly. Weinberger was initially placed in uh, various English boarding schools. Then he started an apprenticeship in engineering in a factory in South Wales, which was owned by one of his uncles. And he also studied art with the Welsh painter and printmaker, Kerry Richards. So here we have two big influences on him, his cousin, Heinz Koppel, and Kerry Richards, his tutor. Uh, for a short period near the end of the Second World War, uh, Weinberger served in the Jewish Brigade in Italy. He spent a brief period in a military prison in Hamburg uh, due to an altercation with a commanding officer regarding his Jewish identity, but he was eventually honorably discharged in 1956. And after the war, he went to Chelsea School of Art and he studied art with his former tutor, Kerry Richards there, um, following Kerry Richards really, but he did have some difficulties there. His paintings were colourful and expressive and they didn't fit in with the, the prevailing style. The, the Euston Road School was very popular at that time. It favoured realism and muted tones and he, he did not want to, to follow that, that trend. So he turned to a private tutor. He had private tuition from the emigre German expressionist painter Martin Bloch, who had also taught his cousin Heinz Koppel. And here we have some works by Martin Bloch. And Bloch was a key influence on Weinberger's style and subject matter. And Weinberger greatly admired him. Um, they kept in touch. And in later life, as Weinberger's own career advanced, he did quietly support Martin Bloch. Um, Weinberger left Chelsea and continued his studies at Goldsmiths, where his painting was more favorably received. And then in 1950, he trained as an art teacher. He taught in various schools and colleges until the early 1960s. Then in 1964, he took a teaching post at Lanchester Polytechnic, which is now Coventry University. And he had a difficult time there because um, during his years at the Lanchester, Coventry became a centre for the conceptual art movement. 
which questioned the very notion of painting, but Weinberger himself remained a staunch traditionalist and he continued to offer courses in traditional methods of, of painting and drawing. He often came into clashes with staff and students, but many did appreciate his approach to art teaching and um, he certainly had a reputation as a good teacher. Um, he remained at the Lanchester, he became head of painting and stayed there until 1983 when he retired to concentrate on painting full time. He regularly exhibited his work both in the UK and in Germany and with his London dealer, uh, Duncan Campbell. Here he is with, with two of his paintings. Um, this is in 1981. He married Barbara, Barbara Hermann, the daughter of the distinguished architectural historian Wolfgang Hermann in 1951. They had one daughter, Joanna, in 1954 and later two grandsons who he was very close to. In 1969, the Weinbergers settled in Leamington Spa in a large Victorian house, which became the backdrop for Weinberger's extensive collection of curios. Um, he, he was an avid collector, Chinese, Indian, Indonesian and African masks and carved figures, Eastern and Christian religious icons, model boats and puppets crowded the shelves and the tabletops and, and found their way into many of his paintings. And he stayed in this house for the rest of his life and um, it, it became an, an expression of his art. He traveled widely. Um, one particular trip was an extended visit um, in the mid seventies to study Russian icons. Um, it was by means of a goldsmith traveling fellowship. and This had a big influence on his art. He had a wide social circle. He knew many academics, intellectuals and fellow emigres. Uh, in the 1970s, he met the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch, and this was the start of a 20 year friendship, which I'll, I'll come on to in, uh, later. Quite by chance on holiday in Positano in the 1990s, he discovered that Grigory Osharov, the family painter of his childhood, who had, had left Germany in the 1930s, um, Quite by chance, he discovered that, that Osharoff had settled in Positano, continued painting and lived there for many years. Also late in life in his 80s, he felt immensely honored to make contact with Nicholas Winton, organizer of the Kinder Transport. And he kept painting almost until his death, aged 85 in 2009. I'll turn now to a more specific focus on Weinberger's painting and drawing. Um, and I'd like to, to offer some comments from art historians and critics to help to give an idea of, of Weinberger's style and subject matter and influences. The art historian Nicholas Watkins wrote in his obituary for Weinberger in The Guardian in 2009. His most obvious progenitors were Vincent van Gogh and Henri Matisse. In continuing to explore their legacy outside the vicissitudes of contemporary style and fashions, Weinberger's art was belated in ambition. However, beneath the apparent celebration of what gives pleasure to the eye, there lies in his work a feeling of anxiety and alienation. Still lives, landscapes and interiors are fractured into isolated patterns and blocks of color. Seemingly stable planes buckle and heave, a mood approaching melancholy prevails. Iris Murdoch, in her 1992 catalogue introduction for an exhibition at Duncan Campbell Gallery in London, wrote, his works relate us to the deep emotions and profound joys of the early periods of the 20th century, when painting was a great universal exploration, when painters adored paint and worshipped colour, inspired by passion and controlled imagination and courageous faith in art. And finally, uh, David Phillips wrote in the catalogue introduction to Weinberger's 2003 retrospective show at Leamington, it is colour that this artist has been wrestling with all his life and its magnetism has filled his mind to the extent that nothing else matters much. He draws with colour, he creates pictorial space with colour, he separates out mass with colour, the sky, the sea, the earth are no more than notations of colour. So given these comments and the emphasis on Weinberger as a colorist, his, his very early work might seem surprising. There's a couple of examples here. These two paintings of the Spaniards in on Hampstead Heath, where he used to go as a student, 
and of his wife Barbara in the early years of their marriage bear the influence of the then much admired Euston Road School. And the school emphasised realism and a dominant focus on tonal relations with little consideration of, of colour's potential. By the light, late 1940s, the Euston Road School had largely degenerated into the production of rather narrow provincial and mechanical paintings. Um, Weinberger remarked in an interview in, in 1995 that at the art school, what was on offer was really the Euston Road type of art. Um, that is grey on grey, delicate, illustrative sort of work. And he said, I wasn't considered a good student because I used rather strong colour, which was considered vulgar. It was a means to an end. I needed the qualification, so I did the things that we were asked to do. They were not done with the conviction with which I normally paint. Weinberger's devotion to colour led him into what he described as fairly violent arguments with his tutors when he went to Chelsea. Um, at Goldsmiths, his tutors were slightly more sympathetic to his views, but the strain of being obliged to adapt to popular taste in order to pass his art school examinations haunted him for many years. And that realisation when he was a student that the art schools were, he said, conditioning students in a way to make them function within the art idiom of the day, gave him the conviction in later life to encourage his own students' individuality. And guided by Kerry Richards and by Martin Bloch, um, Weinberger determinedly broke away from convention and his colours became more and more vivid as he strove to find ways of using colour to communicate the essence of experience. Um, as you can see here, here are some examples of his later work and I'll, I'll pick up on some of these a little later on. But I just wanted to, to give um, an idea of, of, of the, the range of his work. Julian Freeman, um, then visual arts manager at the Barbican, writing in 1990, um, notes Weinberger's formidable skills as a colourist. And he goes on to observe, Weinberger's palette is surely unique among those used by any contemporary British painter. Together with his methods of composition, those colours have undergone a steady refinement since his intense 1950s half tones, which were dependent on heavy impasto or line in paint for the suggestion of volume and mass. In time, his pigments have increased in brilliance to their present bright ochre state, in which the colours themselves confer form and contour at the boundaries between strong contrasting or complementary tones. Um, David Fraser Jenkins, writing in the Arts Review, also in 1990, um, comments, an infection caught by British artists of the mid-century was to be semi-abstract so as to say to make a still life distorted or an expressionist mix that became a landscape. Weinberger's art has never seemed at all abstract, yet his delay before gaining his language was in part the force of his training in the studio of Martin Bloch, and in part that it was not until the late 60s, with the abstract art of the new generation, that he found his way of painting that was both narrative and freely coloured within the same canvas. It's as much a matter of drawing as of colour, he uses an eccentric looped line which undermines the material reality of his subjects and yet makes almost organic the coloured staging. The two parts rhyme and the same shape almost repeats in different scales. The colours are flat and applied evenly. The scale is adjusted as precisely as in a Lake Kandinsky. The figure or the boat or whatever is the figure of the painting is perfectly balanced and yet so exactly pressured from all around that it denies its own gravity and floats, and in this released state can enter the imagination like a character on the stage. So these simplified forms and, and the Weinberger's heightened colours that, that reverberate with emotion are reminiscent of German Expressionism, although critics have been cautious about placing him within the context of, of German Expressionism. Nicholas Watkins, for example, states the obsessive concern with emotions feelings and moods would place his work in the sensitive self-analytical tradition of the Middle European expressionism of his origins, but a more precise placement within that context would not, I feel, be particularly helpful. His work is obstinately personal. In Weinberger's mature work and his later work, there are certain images that recur repeatedly, and in particular, that's images of rivers, seas, boats, ships, landscapes, masks, and religious iconography. Um, and firstly, I'd like to consider 
the image of the mask, as you can see here, it recurs in Weinberger's painting. It, the mask was for him a fluid multifaceted protein symbol. Um, for him, it simultaneously separated and connected inner life and outer reality as they can constantly interact, shift and refocus. He collected masks. He had over 30 masks in his collection and, and painted them often. And he relished both the protection from scrutiny and the energizing space for imaginative experimentation with which masks provided him. The art historian Julian Gardner, writing in The Independent in 2009, observes that masks recur constantly in Weinberger's painting, often with demonic force. The masks in his paintings were more than a visual metaphor or a fetish. Masks conceal and yet allow surreptitious scrutiny without betraying the observer's real expression. And this appealed deeply to Weinberger's inquisitive mind. Weinberger's 1976 exhibition catalogue makes reference to a painting in which the serenity of the Japanese mask on the right is confronted by the aggression of the Balinese mask on the left. And this description suggests that the painting is the one shown in the center here, which presents a striking juxtaposition of moods and colors. In the early 90s painting on the left, three images of a Balinese dancing mask from his collection float almost weightlessly on a background of flat blocks of colour. The mask is presented from three different angles, prompting viewers to shift and refocus between them. The mask is depicted facing forward and in profile, inscrutably watching its viewer. It has also been reversed so that it's shown from the back, positioned so that the viewer has the impression of putting his or her own face inside it, and thus participating in the creation of its illusion as well as being outside it as a passive spectator, seeing its hollowness and two-dimensionality. The power of form to both conceal and reveal truth is embodied in the paradoxical qualities of the Balinese mask, traditionally thought to induce by magic a trance-like state in the wearer, and also conversely to become a mediating vehicle, enabling the wearer to communicate with the gods. And lastly, we have Weinberger's 1990 self-portrait, Me Wearing the Venetian Masks. In this self-portrait, he isolates one mask for focused contemplation while preserving its inherent dynamism. The artist's head, emerging from inky blue-black shadows which cover much of the canvas, is almost entirely obscured by a plain white mask and a dark three-cornered hat. The mask is an item, again, from Weinberger's icon collection. He described its presence in this self-portrait as rather ominous, rather frightening, really. It's a Venetian mask. It's a copy of a Venetian mask. It's not an original mask and a very dark background. Its simple stylized stark features, its concealment of the entire face and its combination with the tricorn hat all indicate that it's the kind of mask known as a volto, meaning face, or lava, meaning ghost. It's the most anonymous type of carnival mask which may have increased its appeal for Weinberger. Because it hides the wearer's identity almost entirely, it provides freedom to transgress social convention. Weinberger has not included the mouth, which would have been delineated on the original Volto mask, as if silencing himself in a refusal to interact, which fortifies the barrier between himself and the world. His emphasis on the mask being a copy, not an original, serves as a reminder that layers of artifice separate inner consciousness and outer reality. A mask is a copy of a face, and this mask is a copy of a copy. Weinberger's face hovers ghost-like behind the Venetian mask, and his face is itself yet another mask, mediating the inner reality beneath or beyond it. The artist stares through the mask's apertures with a direct questioning expression, as if defying the viewer to penetrate its mystery. Weinberger's mask foregrounds the theatricality of any attempt to represent the self. Regardless of whether an artist intends to project a social persona or to lay bare the inner self in confessional style, all representations of the self inevitably involve performance. Weinberger's audience is, of course, also himself. By imposing a mask on the reflected image at which he gazed as he painted himself, Weinberger is perhaps acknowledging that he would not be able to see himself entirely objectively any more than any other viewer. Whether creating a portrait of the self or of another, the clarity of the artist's vision is inevitably marred to some extent by his own fantasies. The mask is inexorably a part of him 
and of every human being. I'd like to move to a discussion of Weinberger's Inside Outside series of the mid seventies, which he described as a series of pictures that were partly part of the workroom or studio and partly the outside world. And the outside world had as much validity as inside. An example from the series is shown here from 1975. The inside outside paintings assumed the significance of icons for Weinberger. He said they were among the best paintings he'd ever done. And the series seems to have been inspired by the iconography which Weinberger viewed in monasteries and art galleries in Russia and the Sinai Desert, whilst on the Goldsmiths Travel Fellowship that he undertook in, in the mid seventies. An icon is often understood as a window to heaven, occupying a boundary between internal and external realities, which when opened allows them to merge. On returning from his travels, Weinberger created numerous representations of the view from his studio window in a sustained interrogation of his relationship to external reality. In this example, blocks of bold, flat, interacting colours cause the boundary between inner and outer to become less distinct, although still identifiable. And on the boundary, a carved figure from Weinberger's collection is placed. The single sentinel figure in the Inside Outside series not surprisingly begins to take on the appearance of the artist himself, the art historian Nicholas Watkins states. And he goes on, in the Inside Outside series, the dividing line between the exterior and interior is nowhere clear. The garden enters the studio, which becomes, in effect, a metaphor for the artist's mind. The image of the window has been associated with the experience of trauma. For instance, um, Ruth Miller notes that in the fiction of Virginia Woolf, characters who suffer from more exacerbated forms of alienation, such as Septima Smith in Mrs Dalloway, are imprisoned behind windows. Julian Gardner, writing in 1996, comments that an enduring motif for Harry Weinberger is the view from a window, perhaps the deeply interiorized perception of an emigre. The window frame confers a formal concentration to the image, but it impresses on artist and spectator alike the sense either of belonging or alienation. The window might therefore be perceived as a barrier as well as a conduit to inter external reality. Although the barrier cannot be completely dissolved, Weinberger's paintings of windows reveal his attempts to let the colours of external reality enter the prison of the cell. Here are two paintings of, of, by Weinberger um, depicting Berlin, which he completed late in life. In these two paintings, he's revisiting the scene of his childhood, mediating it through imagination, through memory, the transformative powers of art, and above all through colour, in order to find a practical way of contemplating the past and expressing grief for its lost while resisting retreat into fantasy. The first image of Berlin on the left is dominated by the turbulent blues of the river and sky, which imbue the scene with tension. The sky is, according to Weinberger's comments in a 1995 interview, a translation into colour of what I imagine the sky to be, so that there are colours in the sky that I paint which are much stronger and quite different from the colours in the real sky. Restless grey storm clouds sketched in with broad brushwork create an ominous mood and are perhaps suggestive of the menacing Nazi presence which would eventually cause the devastation of Weinberger's home. Weinberger recalled that the war went right through the street in the painting and the house where he lived had disappeared and become a block of flats. So the Berlin paintings therefore depict buildings which were, he said, in the same street, but not exactly where we used to live. They're at the end of the road, which was untouched by bombs. The clouds gather above the houses, which are rendered as simple blocks of pink, brown, cream, pale green and royal blue, curving alongside the water's edge. A wedge of ochre cuts across the foreground, demarcating a grassy parkland. That's where I played as a child. That's where I stood when I drew, he stated. A bridge rebuilt after destruction by Nazi forces is par partially visible, as is a little of the embankment. Skeletal leafless trees, which Weinberger described as very thin and very lonely, jut upwards bisecting the arc of the river. Weinberger himself found it quite difficult to talk about this painting. When pressed by the interviewer on that occasion for a fairly literal description of it, 
he replied that it was something that I find very difficult to put into words. Maybe if I could put it into words, I wouldn't even want to paint it. And in that interview, he attempts to describe this scene in both English and German. And he concludes that both languages are inadequate to communicate its meaning, although he says it is slightly easier in, in German than the language of his childhood. Um, in this second painting um, in Berlin, his imagination treats the subject very differently. It, it's distilled and transformed his memories into a, a nostalgic romantic scene and a kind of lost Eden. The painting includes some of the same details as, as the first, the curve of houses, the bridge, the river. But this version is alive with rhythmic harmonious colors which create a dreamlike and lyrical atmosphere. The lighter palette is spring-like and joyful. The trees which were previously stark and bare are here bursting into leaf. The blue water ripples and sparkles and the storm clouds have been replaced by delicate hues of pink and turquoise. The desolate ochre stretch in the foreground is here verdant grass on which a couple are embracing. Weinberger meditated at length on, on his childhood experiences. Um, he painted them, he wrote about them. He wrote in his memoir that those nine years made me into the person that I still am. He found a way of processing those early traumatic experiences in his art. And then he placed those paintings aside, implicitly accepting that his best endeavors to render those memories must inevitably still be inadequate. He stated in 1995 that he would not attempt any further paintings of his childhood home, but these two paintings remained as icons for him, continually regenerating meaning. The painting on the left now hangs in the office of the British ambassador in Berlin. So its location represents a kind of homecoming for its creator. Weinberger's Berlin perhaps never truly existed except in his imagination and memory, but it's now captured in the paintings pointing beyond itself to the truth inherent in his deeply personal vision. And his shimmering palette of colour grants him a, a form of triumph by transforming into joy the pain inherent in that forced departure from his own Eden. I'd like to turn now to a consideration of Weinberger's friendship with the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch, their 20 year dialogue on art and artist and art teaching and its impact on them both. And this is the main focus of, of my book. Um, here they are together. So Iris Murdoch and Harry Weinberger first met in Provence in 1975. Uh, they met through mutual friends, the poet Stephen Spencer and his wife, Natasha, a concert pianist. Um, the Murdochs were visiting the Spenders in Provence and uh, they, they met the Weinbergers who were also holidaying there. And at that time, Murdoch was then well established in her novelistic career. She had 17 novels to her name. She'd won several prizes. She had great popular appeal. She was also a philosopher who had published two significant philosophical works, Sartre, Romantic Rationalist and The Sovereignty of Good. And she was also an experienced teacher, although by this stage she had given up academic life and she was writing novels full time. Weinberger, in contrast, was relatively unknown, although he had been exhibiting regularly in both the UK and Germany. And by 1975, he had um, around 10 individual exhibitions and at least 15 mixed exhibitions to his credit. He was combining work on his own painting with teaching art at Manchester Polytechnic. And he had many concerns about the direction of contemporary art and, and those concerns were shared by Murdoch. He, he confided in her. Um, she instantly recognized his talents. She shared his views and, and she encouraged him to forge his own path. So they met in Provence and on their return to England, Murdoch actually um, sought Weinberger out. She, she visited him at Leamington Spa. She looked at his paintings. She wanted to buy five of them. And he actually says in his memoir that he felt rather patronized by this and said they weren't for sale. She then came along to one of his exhibitions and after that the friendship really took, took off and they started to write to each other and later on she did buy many of his paintings. This was the start of many years of close friendship and intellectual discourse sustained, uh, centered on sustained discussion of the practice, the teaching and the mor morality of art. In Weinberger, who was a deeply committed and erudite painter, Murdoch recognized a kindred spirit who was the practical embodiment of her theoretical ideas. 
about art, and she actively sought to be influenced by him. She positioned herself in the role of his pupil, and she urged him to teach her about the visual arts. She engaged avidly and closely with his work, uh, her sustained questioning of him about his subject matter and his methods, her many requests to see, to discuss, and to purchase his paintings and drawings, and her frequent comments that she found them inspiring and, and that they gave her light. She often says this in the letters. Th these things all suggest Weinberger's influence on her. Weinberger's outward directed prayerful attention to the details of external reality beyond the self echoes an essential aspect of her thinking. Um, uh, also her conception, which she, she discusses in her 1951 essay, Thinking and Language, of thoughts occurring in imaging semi-sensible mode is illuminated by his attempts to represent the elusive images, colors and forms in his mind's eye. Their dialogue goes some way towards realizing the ideal which Murdoch envisages in her 1964 essay, The Idea of Perfection, because it's centered on the practice of joint attention to art, which enables aesthetic and moral progress and clearer perception of, of the other. Um, they visited many galleries together and spent much time viewing art together. And, and she was interested in this idea of joint attention and sharing, um, having a shared object of, of attention. And Weinberger resembles Murdoch's vision of the truth-seeking artist, probing the nature of reality by means of aesthetic form. In her 1977 essay, The Fire of the Sun, she refutes Plato's denigration of the artist as a creator of illusion. Um, and Weinberger certainly stands for what she believed art could do as, as a, a means of seeking truth. So their friendship was characterized by numerous ga gallery visits. The National Gallery, the Courtauld, the BNA, the Wallace Collection were among their favorite places. And here in this sketch by Weinberger, here they are visiting the BNA together. And he, he sent this sketch to her. Murdoch positioned Weinberger as her tutor. She questioned him closely about specific works of art and artists as she strove to develop her views and their discussions overflow into their letters, which are full of painterly references. There are almost 400 letters from Murdoch to Weinberger um, that um, are currently, in, well, they're in the archives at Kingston University. Um, and certainly they were, they were a major source for, for the book. Um, and the letters are full of discussions about art and references to exhibitions and specific artists. Murdoch was already deeply interested in the visual arts by the time she met Weinberger. In her youth, she considered painting and art history as possible career options. She realised that, in fact, she would, she would become a writer, but she, she channeled her experimentation with the visual arts into her novels. And she weaves imagery and techniques drawn from the visual arts into the novels. Um, as part of her quest to intensify readers' emotional, intellectual, visual and linguistic engagement with the text um, and, and thereby to enhance their, their perception. Although this discourse with Weinberger deepens our understanding of many of the allusions in her novels to great, great works of art which they loved and viewed together, the, the main focus in the book is actually on how the presence of Weinberger's own pictures, his techniques, his imagery in Murdoch's novels opens up new interpretations of her work. Weinberger's thoughts about art and artists, his aesthetic approaches, in, in particular his, his colour play, his imagery of rivers, seas, boats and ships, landscapes, masks, religious iconography, his experimentation with portraiture and elements of his life, including his early years devastated by the rise of Hitler and his eventual career as an art teacher, all contribute to shaping Murdoch's perception of reality and her representations of it in her novels. To give some specific examples of, of Weinberger's impact on Murdoch, um, firstly, there's, there's his ideas about colour. Um, Murdoch's ideas about colour came from a diverse range of sources, from Plato to the poet Raina Maria Rilke and her friend, the colour theorist Dennis Paul, and, and also Weinberger. The Weinberger should certainly be counted as another influence on her thinking about colour. She was um, intrigued by his, his highly distinctive colour rhetoric. He was embracing the freedom that colour offered to simplify shapes and, and to move away from um, mimesis. And certainly 
um, when she meets him, her experimentation with colour gathers momentum, particularly in her mature novels of the late 70s and, and 1980s, Nuns and Soldiers and The Good Apprentice. The colour play in these novels can be reassessed in the context of Murdoch's discourse with Weinberger. Nuns and Soldiers is partly set in Provence, where they first met, and Weinberger's many vibrant paintings and drawings of Provence um, had a substantial impact on her descriptions of Provence in, in that novel. Also in that novel, Nuns and Soldiers, there's, there's a painter character, Tim Reed, who's, who's partly inspired by Weinberger's identity and experiences. Riverscapes and seascapes were enduring subjects for, for Weinberger, intimately connected with the vision of boats on the river from his, his Berlin childhood. And here are a, a few examples of, of those paintings, including one on the left there, which Murdoch purchased from Weinberger, and she placed that over her uh, study desk. And in the, the letters, Murdoch's letters to Weinberger reveal that his images of boats, river and sea scenes were much in her thoughts as she wrote The Good Apprentice. And they, they coalesced in her thoughts to become the, the colour drenched and transcendent vision of boats on water, which is perceived through a window by the, the main character in that novel, um, Edward Baltram. And the novel shows the influence not only of Weinberger's imagery of, of boats and, and uh, water, but also his techniques. When that character finally sees the sea, he describes it as glowing like stained glass. And, and, and the, the description in the novel does seem to evoke Weinberger's river and seascapes with their blocks of vivid colour and, and their strong outlines. Um, he influenced her in, in other ways, certainly when it comes to, to masks. His enduring fascination with masks, his sustained discussions of them um, with Murdoch, his many paintings of them, particularly his paintings of the early 90s, seem to have galvanised her thinking and, and functioned as catalysts for her idea play surrounding masks, which, which seemed to reach fruition in her 1993 novel, The Green Knight. And in this novel, a profusion of, of masks, both literally and metaphorically, seems to reveal how easily imagination can lapse into fantasy and, and are certainly um, tied up with Murdoch's concerns about post-structuralism and, and her fear that uh, form may be mistaken as, as the only reality. Um, so there, there are numerous ways in which Weinberger can be understood as a minor yet significant influence on, on Murdoch's thinking and, and his, his presence is certainly there in the novels, both his imagery, his techniques and, and also his, his identity and experiences. As a German Jewish emigre, he did have a particular appeal for Murdoch. And Murdoch knew and loved many emigres. Um, and here, here are just some of them. Um, Edward Frankel, a German Jewish classical scholar who in 1934 sought refuge from the Nazis in England and became Oxford's Corpus Christi professor of Latin and he taught Murdoch there. Also the Austrian Jewish academic and poet Franz Steiner, who in 1950 became lecturer in social anthropology at the Anthropological Institute in Oxford. Arnaldo Momigliano, a professor of ancient history at University College London, who'd come to England from Nazi Germany in 1939. And also there we have Miklos Vito, a, a philosopher and historian who'd been forced to flee Hungary because he participated in, in the 1956 revolution. And um, his, his doctoral thesis was supervised by Murdoch at Oxford. And that the lives of all of these emigres made a deep impression on Murdoch's thoughts and became an important aspect of her fiction. At the time when she first met Weinberger in, in 1975, she'd already begun to probe the effects of the atrocities of the Second World War on human consciousness in the novels. Um, for example, through the creation of characters such as Willie Cost in her 1968 novel, The Nice and the Good. Uh, Willie Cost is a Holocaust survivor who struggles to contain his suffering and, and to divert it into his creative work. And he bears some resemblance to Weinberger in that respect. And Weinberger's recollections of his harrowing formative experiences, which he confided to Murdoch, are likely to have influenced her portrayal of certain characters in her later novels, such as Marcus Valla in the, the 1989 novel, The Message to the Planet, um, who's obsessed with the suffering of the Jews, and uh, to an Abelson in, in her last novel, Jackson's Dilemma, who struggles with the guilt um, intrinsic to 
to existence in a post To conclude, I'll just come back to this image of, of Murdoch and Weinberger together. Though Weinberger was a minor artist and Murdoch was a major writer, they did share this common identity in their construction of reality and their, their innovative attempts to attend to and depict reality by means of aesthetic form. Weinberger's attempts to realize the images in his mind's eye did not always satisfy him and his output was somewhat uneven. Uh, he, he said in interview, I want my work to exist in the timeless tradition of painting, but because I see that when a particular picture is finished, it never quite matches my original intention, I start the next one immediately. Uh, Murdoch similarly observed, all the time one is terribly conscious of one's limitations as an artist, one's always hoping to do better next time. Like Murdoch, Weinberger was continually reflective and self-critical about his practice. He had um, comprehensive intellectual and theoretical knowledge and understanding of what he wanted to achieve, and he, he was unwavering in his pursuit of perfection. And this was an issue which very much preoccupied Murdoch too. And this sustained contact with Weinberger, who, who really was a kindred spirit and was interrogating the issues which so preoccupied her, informed and inspired Murdoch and had an enduring impact on her vision of the world. By integrating Weinberger's ideas, imagery and techniques into her novels, Murdoch found ways to expand the potential of language and so to render experience with greater accuracy. Bearing out her observation in 1951, um, in her essay, Thinking and Language, that not all our new concepts come to us in the context of language, but the attempt to verbalize them may result not in frustration, but in a renewal of language. And it, it's my hope that the book will not only provide a new way of interpreting Murdoch's novels, but also will, um, I hope, make Weinberger's remarkable paintings and his remarkable life known to a, a wider audience. And uh, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rebecca. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, if you'd like to just um, exit from, that's yeah. it. And let's now highlight you again. Your, your, yes, your, and let me point myself perhaps. Um, like there, there we go. Very good. I don't see any questions or comments coming in yet, but please now, now is the moment. Um, maybe I can start off by picking up on some of the things that you, you touched on. Um, this kind of, if you like, predisposition to be sympathetic, to, to wish to enter, you know, sort of into a relationship with, with immigrants, Jewish or otherwise, um, from that period. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? And one thing I discovered, I hadn't realised that, in fact, I think I'm right in saying that she actually worked for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration in yes. those crucial years, 1944 to 1946, which yes. has a great deal to do with that. And I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about what she actually got up to and how, you know, what she wrote about it, that experience. Yes, I think it was a very profound experience for her. Um, she, um, she had quite a difficult time personally through the 1940s with feeling rather um, directionless and drifting. And, and certainly that experience um, was, was in, in a sense a sort of grounding experience and, and made her um, aware of, of others and other lives, other, other directions. And, and um, of course, um, she, she wanted to, to do something, to, to contribute in some small way to trying to, to alleviate suffering. Um, she had to become very practical and, and to, to try and, and do what she could. And she, she met um, many people who she, she tried to, to help. And, and um, I, I'm not sure if that's where her, her um, emigre friendships sort of began or, or whether it's earlier, but certainly she, she met and kept in contact with many people through that experience. Um, some of whom became friends or students later on. Um, it was also during her, her years of education that she, she came across remarkable intellectual figures like Edward Frankel um, and Franz Steiner a little later on. So, so these, these figures certainly um, found their way into her thinking and, and into her writing. I was thinking she also had a relationship at one point with Elias Canetti, am I? Yes, you didn't mention. Yes, yes I didn't, okay. didn't mention yeah. her name. Yes, 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 yes that was, that was um, yeah. an important yeah. relationship for her. Um, and um, it, it's often thought that the um, that there's a recurring figure in her novels, of a, a kind of enchanter, um, a, a male, um, an, an older male um, figure um, who who has power over other characters often. Mm -hmm. um, and it's thought that Canetti could could be behind that, that representation. 
interesting. Perhaps apropos Canetti, it's worth mentioning that he had a long term, but ultimately rather, uh, what shall I say, inconclusive relationship with another wonderful emigre painter, female painter called Marie Louise von Motosinski. Mm. And mm. just actually making links while I think about it, a uh, talk coming up in May is with Kathy Henderson, whose book, The Disappearing Uncle, actually features Marie Louise in, in the narrative. So that's, by the way, but do look out for that mm. as well. Now, interesting. And then Visa Canetti, his long suffering wife, um, was also a very talented novelist. So should also not be not be forgotten. Um, the Tortoises, I think, is a remarkable work that she wrote just uh, after coming. Was it just? I think I'm trying to remember if it was immediately after she came to England or actually when she was, began writing in the process, you know, of of of, of transferring her, her life, as it were, to to this country. So these are Canetti's very mm. interesting too. Mm. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm really curious, and I suspect a lot of other people are. You you know, you obviously alluded to a lot of uh, books by Murdoch, and I suspect none of them are so nearly as expert as you are in the exchange uh, sort of extent of her earth. But do you have any short passages that you could? fish out, as it were, and extract briefly to just give us a flavour of what you mean when that influence from Weinberger is perhaps manifest. Don't worry if you haven't oh, put them down. I don't, I don't think I have anything to hand. No. I'm trying to think. Um, it, it's cert certainly in, in, the, um, in the study, I look at five novels in particular. Hmm. Um, so it, it's more the mature later novels. So, so I mean, it, it's a shame I, I can't got anything to, to quote, but um, the ones I look at particularly are The Sea, the Sea, which won the Booker Prize in 1978, um, and then Nuns and Soldiers in 1980, The Good Apprentice in 85, and then The Green Knight in 93, and then her last novel, 95, and those seem to be the ones where Weinberger's influence can be felt most. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are many other references that, that perhaps I haven't picked up on, but it certainly seemed to me that those, those five stood out in, in terms of um, imagery and colour play and, and also autobiographical details. Um, they're certainly filtering in into those five. I'm just curious because I'm, you know, I'm no expert, but I, I, I was put in mind as you were talking of the A.S. Byatt fascination with Henri Matisse. And of course, Matisse mm. is somebody you didn't mention by name. But when you look actually indeed at those window images, you know, everything you said is perfectly valid. But on top of that, or as well as that, there is undoubtedly surely the influence of Matisse and his fascination with the interior and exterior space. Mm. You know, the Matisse, it's called Matisse stories, in fact, by A.S. Byatt, which are yeah. intensely yeah. visual in their actual language. And I wondered if that's actually the case in Iris Murdoch's um, writing, that it is, you know, is it as simple, I'm sure it's not as simple as that, but is there a strongly visual element in the way she writes, which is directly attributable to her interest in, in the visual arts generally, and perhaps, you know, Weinberger in particular? Yes, I, it's interesting that you mentioned Bayat, because mm -hmm. um, Bayat was heavily influenced by Murdoch. And, ah, okay, and, right. There you are. Interesting, interesting like, connections yeah. there, and Bayat's written on Murdoch, and, and they were friends, and they knew each other well, and, and so it, it, in, in some ways, very, very similar writers, I think, mm -hmm. and, and um, it's interesting to look at those together. Um, I, I think certainly she was very interested in the visual arts long before she ever met Weinberg. Mm -hmm. she, she knew many artists in her social circle and, and um, she, she courted the company of artists. She, she, she sought out those, those relationships. And, and um, she was, as she said herself in, in, in one of her journal entries, she, she was aware she was a little romantic about artists sometimes. And, um, and uh, she, she was aware of that tendency, but she, she certainly was fascinated by um, the process of creating visual works of art and, and how that came about. And um, in her, uh, her early, early adult life, she, she attempted painting herself and thought about pursuing that. Um, she she possibly continued painting through the 60s and 70s and, and just sort of continued to to, to dabble with with that we're, we're not quite sure exactly when um she she turns away from it or if she ever did completely but um I think because she realized that she she couldn't quite work out how she would do it herself she, she was interested in how other people managed to 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 recreate images in their mind's eye and, and how how they um, used colour and, and shape and form to, to do that and because she she realised that words were going to be her medium she, she diverted that interest into the novels I think and tried to to work towards a more fully synesthetic way of communicating where she could try and, and have that that um, that more visceral impact on the reader by trying to employ all the senses and, and to think about engaging colour and image and, and light and shape and, and so on to try and, and have that more direct impact. 
Um, and, and I think Bayat is, is doing that too at times. So um, it's a similar sort of pattern, I think. Good, I'm glad to hear I intuitively mm. made, made the connection. Very good. And um, do any of her paintings survive at all? Yes, that well, I, I know of three that again are in the Kingston archive. Mm -hmm. Um they're they're um paintings of the, around the early 40s. Um there's a still life and there's a couple of um well scene landscapes, scenes of, of houses in, in um in the countryside. And um she um she does mention in her letters of the early 40s, of course, this is long before Weinberger, but she she talks about painting a lot. Um, she mentions the influence of Paul Nash. Mm -hmm. um, she talks about going to, to galleries herself and um, and um, trying to develop her ideas. But she she was really on the lookout for a, a tutor, I think. And uh, although she did visit galleries with other people, she, she particularly seemed to latch on to Weinberger as someone who could who could help her to develop her thinking about art and, and gain confidence with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, uh, although they met fairly infrequently, when they did meet, it generally took the form of a, a gallery visit, a sort of London meeting, where where they would um, uh, visit a gallery, and, and she would be she'd be um, interrogating him really for for, mm -hmm. for his views, and uh, um, that that tended to be how it. And, and then that discussion overflowed into the letters, um, which um, are full of, of similar sort of references. Really interesting. You mentioned before we uh, started the session properly that um, Joanna Garber, who I don't think is actually with us mm -hmm. this evening, unfortunately, but uh, Harry's um, daughter, who I've been in touch with as well, um, donated the whole, the whole the cache of letters, the correspondence between them, to the Kingston uh, Iris Murdoch archive. It was it 2012? And I'm curious to know, I mean, was there any real awareness before that, and your indeed your research on this topic, of the close links between them and indeed the influence that Weinberger you know, clearly exerted on Iris Murdoch. It, it's mentioned very briefly mm -hmm. in the, um, the, the the biography, the the, the, um, the the official biography of Iris Murdoch, which came out in two thousand and one. Peter Conradi's biography, mm -hmm. which is sort of definitive work, a huge mm -hmm. huge biography. Um, it, it's very briefly touched on that she it it, it just said something like she had friends. She was friends with many artists, including Harry Weinberger. Um, and, and one or two just fleeting references, but it, it was not really until the letters came into the archive that uh, that, that the the, the, um, the the true scale of the friendship and, and its implications were um, were found. Um, so yes, it was when Joanna kindly um, gifted the letters and, and also very generously made made other material available to me that, that we were able to explore it further. Great. I wonder if I could ask if there is anybody from Harry's family in the audience. I didn't recognise any names, but now is the moment. If you'd like to reveal yourself, you'd be most welcome. And I'm looking at the time. It's drawing late. And uh, if anybody would like to ask Rebecca anything or indeed make any comments now, now is clearly the moment. No? <laughs> um, I wonder if I... I'll give you a few minutes just to give you a last chance. But... Um, I'd like to perhaps end, if I, if I may, if really nobody wants to chip in at this point, with a quotation from Harry Weinberger, which I myself have often used in the lectures I've given. Ah, oh, hold on, great, oh, nice, okay. Thanks from Miles, Miles Leeson, um, that I often give um, as typifying certainly what seems to me a dominant strand if one talks in terms of the, yeah, the prevalent style that the emigres brought with them. And in Harry's case, it's very interesting because he was only a, a young boy or you know a teenager when he comes and I was interested I don't think I quite realized that in his very early work it's really quite muted and as you say trying to kind of toe the line with regard to the Euston Road School um, and then it bursts out into color and a very different way of doing things uh, which is actually much closer indeed to Martin Bloch and uh, Heinz Koppel and many many others and I, I wonder if I could just sort of end by, by quoting something which I think seems very apposite and I will say also that it's something that Oscar Kokoschka who's obviously a much better known and indeed older artist you know corroborated but this is what Harry Weinberger said and uh, I will now quote it to you I won't I won't try and imitate his, his accent because he did have a very strong accent I think to the very end of his life but he said as much as I have an accent in my language I have an accent in my painting in German art in our century, so he's clearly identifying, in spite of coming as a youngster to this country with that, in German art in our century, expressionism and feeling comes into it a lot, whereas mainstream art in Britain is more good taste and playing down feelings. 
The majority of people find my painting too emotive, too direct. English art is refined understatement. Now, of course, like any generalization, you know, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But I think nevertheless, you know, that that basic sentiment has been echoed by many artists. Um, as I say, Kokoschka being a, a notable example of that. And I think maybe that's quite a good point at which to, to sort of end tonight. Um, I'll just check. Was there another part from the uh, great talk? Uh, no? No. OK. Um, all right. Well, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll end properly on a more practical note by saying, as I mentioned earlier, that this talk has been uh, recorded and the recording will be uploaded onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel within a few days. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, <laughs> familiar with uh, the YouTube channel, you might want to, first of all, check out, in fact, the Insiders Outsiders Festival .org website. And there's actually a link on the homepage to the YouTube channel. And um, I will actually send I will send a follow up um, email to everybody who signed up including those who didn't actually log in this evening because I'm also pleased to be able to say that the publishers have offered a 20% discount on the cover price both I think the physical book and also the ebook of Rebecca's fascinating uh, new publication so I'll send you details of that and you might also be interested to know that Charlotte Brandt, who is the granddaughter of Martin Bloch, gave a talk, The Insiders Outsiders, about her grandfather not so very long ago. And I'll, I'll send you the link to that and uh, possibly various other things that uh, occur to me might be of interest um, to you. So I think probably that's enough for one evening. Uh, last, last chance. No. <laughs> OK. Rebecca, thanks ever so much. I hope your book does really well. Um, I should perhaps also mention that for those of you who might balk at <laughs> spending money on a hardback, it will be coming out, uh, I'm pleased to say, in paperback at some point next year. Um, but uh, I will send you, as I say, I'll send you the details for the, uh, the new hardback. Um, lovely. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Rebecca, once again, thank you very much indeed. And perhaps I'll see you again at subsequent talks. All the best and keep well. <laughs>